Welcome to M Squared TechCast, a live internet radio show offering the latest right, news and trends talking people points. driving business, Jesus. technology, and politics in Michigan. Sent those around an hour and a half ago. Matt Roush and Mike Brennan. Hey, it's Matt Roush. And Mike Brennan. And I've got disappearing email disorder, um, but Mike, if you'll send me the talking points again, we can talk about it. Okay, well, let's start off with Bob Moore. Uh, okay. we, both, we both know Bob. Uh, Bob was working with uh, my, one of my business partners, Kate O'Hare and I, and uh, we were, brought him on about a month and a half ago before all hell broke loose in the pandemic <laughs> world, where we were talking about financing for CBD companies and cannabis companies and things like that. Well, Bob can essentially, it doesn't have to be CBD or cannabis, right, Bob? You can essentially finance any type of company in certain ways. Hello, gentlemen. Yes, this, I'm Bob Moore. I've uh, been doing commercial financing for 40 years. And a uh, matter of fact, since I have talked to you uh, last week, I uh, we processed over a million dollars worth of uh, applications for CBD business owners. Wow. So, but uh, in today's market, Everybody is needing capital, and if you've got an order for hand sanitizers or face mask or something like that, uh, you've got purchase orders from from state governments or county governments or county schools or such. Uh, we help. We've been helping businesses turn get them some money on the purchase orders so they can uh, fill the orders. All right. So how does this process start? Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, well, factoring has been around for, for centuries, actually. Uh, counselor suitable financing. And it's like, okay, another part of that is contracting financing, or in this case, purchase order financing, which is made, could be a one-time deal, could be multiple times. But uh, where businesses get orders, they don't have enough money to fill them. Uh, you know, a lot of times they're making a widget type deal. In this case, they're filling an order. They're they're filling a face mask or or hand sanitizers. That seems to be the two things that are are in the news anyway. But there's lots of things that there's lots of things that's going on other than than uh, COVID nineteen. So what? Well, I mean, that's certainly dominating the headlines and dominating everything that we're covering right now. Uh, uh, and so, uh, as you know, we're working with different folks right now that are developing personal protective equipment, which you mentioned is face masks, shields, sanitizers, gosh, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and I know we've been uh, sending a lot of folks your way. I, I, you probably, uh, is, has that been the dominant part of what people are reaching out to you for? Or are there other things as well? That's, that's the dominant thing that we're getting uh, emails and phone calls about. Uh, Actually, we're still getting a lot of things, just truckers, tr you know, just regular businesses that's up and going. Uh, people that are uh, that are selling furniture, you know, to, to restaurants. Believe it or not, there's still restaurants that are opening. Uh, they're, they're changing up their formula and going to like a four squad deal instead of uh, everybody lined up in a row and, with a bunch of booths type thing. So that's... We may see a lot of uh, restaurants where uh, people are back to back to each other type deal. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, what I'm hearing in other countries, for instance, where they have begun to open is that they're, and this is probably not good news for restaurants, is they take out about half the tables so you can still do the social distancing. And I know having worked on the restaurant business that you got to have at least 50% occupancy or you're just to break even. So it's going to be a very challenging time for restaurants going forward. Yes, but I think what's going to happen is uh, is all these restaurants are are the ones that are are set up beforehand, where they were doing ten percent, maybe five percent carry out business. Now they're doing a hundred percent carry out business. They think that uh, those restaurants think they're going to continue doing a huge amount of takeout business and they they probably will. Uh, I think a lot of people are, are cabin fever right now. So I think president Trump's saying the economy is going to boom. It probably will because people are tired of staying in. 
Ain't that the truth? Yeah. So uh, you also do purchase order. Uh, you do invoicing, factoring, that sort of thing. Uh, so I mean, lots of different ways that people can work with you, right? Yes, we do equipment financing. Uh, so you have uh, invoice factoring, and you got purchase order financing, uh, and equipment financing, and then we do very large commercial loans from a million dollars up. Okay, and you even work with land purchases, if I recall, right? Yes. Matter of fact, uh, we've got several several of pending deals where the CBD business owners is trying to buy more land. Mm. And uh, so, so, so tell me a little bit about the work you do with truckers. I think they're among the sort of unsung or less than loudly sung heroes of this whole situation we find ourselves in right now. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because they they relaxed some all these rules on these truckers that were uh, they're probably not. This is one time where they could probably go 100 miles an hour and never get stopped on, yes. <laughs> on stuff. They've been told to leave them alone and don't check the logbook and stuff like that. But uh, on our trucking program, it's pretty neat because uh, truckers are notorious for not keeping good books uh, on the deal. But uh, if you get an invoice for, uh, let's say for, for $10,000, we'll advance you 95% of it. Uh, normally mm -hmm. for advance, the advance percentage is about 80%. Uh, on truckers, it's 95%. And, and uh, then they also have a card where they, you can, uh, the truckers can fill up fuel on, on the fuel card and it will take care of that. It will all, it will take care, it will offset the fuel card uh, amount and the truckers just keep running. So it's kind of a neat deal if you're a trucker because you don't want to stop to do books. You just want to keep rolling and, and making some money. Well, and the highways are pretty wide open right now. I, I, I mean, I don't get out much except to buy groceries, but when I do, there's hardly any cars on the road, so. There's, I was going to say, at the moment, there's, there's very little cars uh, matter of fact, the on the ag side of it, it's kind of uh, the fuel sales are dropped off so much. The ethanol and the ethanol plants make a CO2 product that that the uh, the meat companies use. They use the CO2 product that the the uh, ethanol plants make. So we may have a CO2 shortage. Interesting. Okay. And in terms of, uh, say, uh, getting back to the personal protective equipment, now, you know, someone wants to book an order. A lot of this is still coming from overseas, and overseas wants at least 50% down, sometimes more than that. How are you dealing with that situation? Basically, it's the, our, our process hasn't changed, and, and the rules on, on clearing hasn't changed. A lot of them want 50% down. you got to do a clearing house. Uh, type deal, bill of lading, and uh, they'll have a confirmation number, and you've uh, you got to show that you've got uh, ability to pay, which that's what we provide for the company, so ability for them to pay the for the goods. And then uh, they have to provide the bill of lading that it's in the process of being shipped here. And so from there, it goes to a clearinghouse. And there, there's a number of different ways to clear the merchandise to verify it and that it's here. So in terms of business, you're probably busier than ever then, right? We are as busy as ever. We really are. It's kind of a, uh, uh, you don't wish anything bad, but we're busy as all get out. And so are lots of, uh, lots of banks are, are busy. Matter of fact, uh, you can't get a loan right now because the, all the banks are doing the PPP program. Right. And uh, so they they've got people called in uh, that they, they haven't seen in, you know, the, <laughs> they've got tellers doing PPP programs and, and paperwork and stuff like that. Yeah. It is strange times. That's for sure. Yes. So how, how did you, how did you get into this business anyway? Did you start out as a banker or a bank officer or how, yes, how did I started you start? out? I'm third generation banker. I, my dad, my grandfather, my father were both bankers, and, uh, insurance agent, real estate agent. By the time I was 18, I, uh, so I had those licenses, had my stockbroker license at 25. So, uh, and just kept uh, working in bank. And so I, I had 
good opportunities to work around very people ask me how do you get so smart and it's like i was around a bunch of smart guys i don't know if, I, if it's, i'm what be smart but i was around a lot of smart old bankers and that yep. was really the the key to it i was around the the, the kemper family uh, at in kansas city hmm. and uh spent a lot of time in the the banking in the commerce bank and united missouri bank both uh, there in, in Kansas City, so I ended up around a lot of a lot of smart people. Okay, we've only got about a minute left, Bob. So why don't you tell folks how they can reach out to you to see if uh, they can work with you to help them get financing? Uh, Bob Moore, Bob Moore Financing, and I'm also at invoicestocash.com. So either either web page will get me. 580-695-0331, bobmorefinancing.com. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks very much, Bob. We appreciate it. Probably get you back on the show here in a couple more months. Hopefully things will calm down on the pandemic front, right? Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah, All right. So we'll be right back with another segment right now. This is Mike Brennan. And Matt Roush. And you're watching MI Tech TV. Lawrence Technological University graduate, Thanks, earn a degree, and a higher well, starting salary. I'll give you a call later. I wanted to talk to you about a few things, but I'll call you later. Okay. LTU fifth among U.S. colleges and universities. Oh, there they are. Okay. at LTU, possible is everything. Oh, hey, are you? Stand by. We're in commercial. Okay, perfect. We're hoping we time this correctly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did good. Faculty and coaches. Why wait? Find out more at ltu.edu. Lawrence Technological University is more than a school. It's a launch pad for your future, offering industry-leading facilities and 100-plus programs that are ranked among the nation's best. Be unstoppable. Be more. And a few possible is everything. Salaries of you Lawrence got the talking points now? Among the yep, they did. Thanks. University in America. Plan a campus visit to meet with counselors, faculty, and it's Mike and Matt, correct? Yeah, I'm Matt. Yeah, that's Matt. I'm Mike over here. Okay. Hey, it's Matt Roush. And Mike Brennan. And, and we're back with another segment of the M Squared TechCast. Uh, we're talking today um, about issues related to the coronavirus pandemic, which is sort of dominating the headlines these days. And we've got a couple of gentlemen here um, who are answering the call, uh, among other things, for personal protective equipment. So, Mike, why don't you ask the first question? Yeah, we have a father and son team here, Darren and Dalton. Uh, and... Uh, how do I pronounce your last name? Ludke. Ludke. Okay. Because I wrote it down wrong. Uh, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> then I didn't want to mess it up, right? So, no problem. Um, yes. So you guys are actually developing the 3D products. And I believe it's 3D mass, right? Well, it's actually three different products. We started off with the face shields um, and then moved over to the face mask alternative um, with using products from that we could source locally here. And then uh, we also have what we're calling uh, surgical mask ear savers to bring the tension off of the back of the mask that the uh, doctors and nurses are making. And this is all a result of uh, people asking and saying that, you know, the need basically is just incredible out there right now. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, uh, how did you, uh, decide? well, I think it was your son that's really heavily involved in that, right? That would be Dalton? Yeah, exactly. Dalton, if you'd talk about the face shield, please. Yeah, so basically this all started off by the uh, 3D printer company that all of our printers are actually from. Their name is Prusa. Uh, they're based out of Prague, and they developed the, these uh, face shields, basically. They're splatter guards um, that doctors uh, wear to protect um, droplets of water or whatever from getting into their eyes. Well, they saw that there was, being, there was a shortage of this all around the world, so they developed their own free model to download and actually produce. Um, which is this right here and so I saw that online and I saw that a lot of people were asking for these and there is actually a, a company out in California called o Operation Shields Up um, that was asking for donation of 3D printed parts for these shields and so from there we just saw that there is demand for all sorts of um, personal protective equipment um, and starting with the shields and then we moved to that uh, masks which you can talk about a little bit. Well, yeah, talk, the biggest talk thing is company, talk about your company a little bit, a uh, little bit of background on the company, what it was formed and sort of what it okay. does during more normal times. Sure. So the name of the company is Durbosity LLC. 
Um, it's a home-based business. And actually, once again, I got to point to my son. He's the brains of the, the operation. Uh, started when he was about 10, 11 years old. He started teaching himself how to do some Java programming because he liked, liked a game called Minecraft so much. And he, didn't, he wanted to build upon that. So um, that kind of propelled us a little bit into saying, you know what, why don't we try to play around with this a little bit? He got into smart home technology um, and he made me talk to all my stuff in my house when he was about 13 years old. And then uh, after that, uh, he started getting into uh, 3D modeling about, what, three years ago? Two, two three years ago, the um, high school I go to, Sequoia High School, um, actually offered a uh, course where you could learn um, not only be, like being able to draw schematics and um, building plans and things like that, but also the 3D uh, modeling aspect of it too. So I, uh, I learned just basically how to design and model anything from there. So basically started with a Christmas gift of a printer and it's uh, propelled us up into where we're at now on something that we never imagined we'd do. Uh, we have no medical background. We're just trying to a call to arms basically to help everybody. And I believe, uh, Dalton, that you were, you're talking to other high school students about doing something similar with their printers, 3D printers, that sort of thing, right? Yeah, well, all around the country right now, basically, there's all sorts of different groups that are set up that are just asking for people to donate um, 3D printed parts. These are things that you can, if you just look in your local area, I, there's probably some kind of group that is looking to accept parts. And like, for instance, um, we've been accepting some parts from some of my friends, like my next door neighbor has a printer and he knows how to 3D print. So he's been able to produce a few. Um, but yeah, people like, all around the country have been able to donate these parts to these various groups and organizations have been able to put them together and get them to the people that need them. Interesting. So how long does it take on, uh, on a home printer to make something like this? So about, um, we do about three, anywhere from three to four masks at a time per printer. Um, and that entire print is about um, anywhere from 13 to 16 hours to do um, those four masks. Um, so it's around, you know, anywhere from like four to six hours per mask, you'd say, um, to produce one of these. And you'll see in the background, I don't know how well people can see, but we've got a print going on right now of these, which is the frame for the face shields. And they come out basically very together and you just start breaking them apart once the print is done. And uh, they, they'll come apart very quickly. Well, typically, if I'm not on camera, they come apart very quickly. <laughs> and then you end, you end up with two of them. So like he said, about 16 hours, and we end up with four shield maps. Shield well, and, and, and the neat thing you can do with 3D printers that is much harder to do, or it's sometimes impossible to do with plastic injection molding, is that you can do cavities and weird adjacencies and stuff like that uh, you know, with, with a 3D printer because there can be gaps in, in you know, the bottle, right? Yeah, so that's that's really why this um, type of technology is important right now, um, because 3D printers are basically creating a stopgap for when we can actually produce injection molded parts. That's like Operation Shields Up, which is in California. That's their whole mission is 3D printers can produce a product virtually instantly. As long as you design it, you can print it in a matter of normally less than a day, whereas injection molding requires lots of testing and it requires lots of expensive equipment. It takes a lot longer to bring a product to market, whereas 3D printing, can you can have it immediately. And that's exactly what it's being used for right now. All right, so uh, how many of these have you made so far? I mean, how, you've been doing this for, what, a couple of weeks now? Um, yeah, it's been about three weeks, three and a half weeks. So a big part of it was sourcing the materials. And uh, these ones here were, I'll say the easy ones. It was just a matter of getting the filament, which we already had here. We did put a big order in waiting for the filament to arrive from the Czech Republic. Um, so these we've done, I think we're over 100, 150 of them. We've shipped out uh, quite a few over to California, but now we've stopped moving them to California because I, we're getting contacted directly and we're doing free shipment 100%. This is by donation. It's going out across the country, different places. Uh, the one that, that took a while though is, these are the, uh, the masks, the, the breathing masks basically. And um, we print the, the green and the red part. There was a source for this rubber material that actually came out of Michigan. Um, I believe it's, um, and I, right, I, Silex, I believe is the name of the company. I don't remember exactly, but they made this, this here specific for this mask that the actual design of this mask was done by a Dr. Mark Causey, 
who is a dentist over in Cumming, Georgia, and this is how we tripped upon this, is he had this mask design, and then Dalton has the brains to take that design and turn it into what we did here. So this mask here is about a three to four hour mask. Then there's the assembly of the rubber. These are hair bands that came from, uh, ah. you know, that, that a girl would wear. Then what we do is you've got to put a filter of some sort on here. And that's the biggest problem right now is what is safe? What's the best filter? This is where our non-medical, non-FDA approved uh, statement comes out is we sourced what we believe based on all of our um, documents and what we've read is going to keep people safer than if they had just a cloth mask on their face. So okay. on the mask part, I'm sorry, Matt, the, um, uh, on the mat, on the mask part, we are, we're up to about 250 to 350, somewhere in that range that we've shipped out to about 12 to 15 different States right now. Uh, so I how, probably, how you, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to ask, how are you reaching out to people to, uh, to request these or are people coming to you because the word's getting out now? Sure. Um, it's through Facebook, through the uh, Derbosity uh, Facebook page, um, and it's at Derbosity, D-E-R-B-O-C-I-T-Y. And um, at first, we were doing this um, out of hide, quite honestly, but we kept getting asked, can we please donate? Can we please donate? And this is where I got to the point of, you know, I think everybody wants to help in their own way. And so we opened up a donation page, and I'm just absolutely blown away at, at the love and the support that has been streaming in from all over the country. And that has kept this operation going. And when I say 24 seven, I kid you not, you know, the hair standing up on end and getting up at two in the morning, swapping out filament uh, has been going on for a solid three weeks now or four. We should probably point out, Darren, that you have a Michigan connection, right? Oh, absolutely. So uh, I retired from the uh, Air Force, actually Air National Guard up at Alpena Combat Readiness Training Center, just north of you guys by about four hours. And as a matter of fact, Dalton was born in the Alpena Hospital. So, and my wife, uh, she is from uh, East Lansing area, actually Mason, and she graduated from CMU. So we've got a strong tie back to Michigan. And you're now living near Atlanta, just outside of Atlanta, right? Correct. Yeah, we're in the met one of the metro counties north of Atlanta right now. And um, I retired out of the Air Force about uh, 15 years ago. And by day, I'm the CEO for a, a tech company, a software a programming company. So this is, I'll say, the by night Dalton's uh, a baby <laughs> that I've partnered up with. <laughs> yeah. And of course, Dalton was saying he wanted to uh, hopefully go to Georgia Tech uh, and use his skills there. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I've always been involved in engineering and like, and just designing and building things all my life and just being able to design things and learning how to do that, like through our high school um, has really enabled me to be able to print all these things and design all these things and understand all this technology. Um, and I hope to go into Georgia Tech for civil engineering or structural engineering, um, some kind of engineering. Um, but yeah, it's all that engineering background um, has really helped me to design all these products and be able to print them. Yeah, Matt uh, actually is the news director for Lawrence Technological University in, in the greater Detroit area. So yeah, that's a, uh, it's a small, it's a small private uh, university. The two biggest programs are engineering and architecture. And in fact, we have a uh, combined five year bachelor master's program in architectural engineering that's uh, growing pretty rapidly. Oh, wow. And, uh, wow. I, I was not aware of that. Well, I, I might just send you some information on that. Make my boss <laughs> very good. Do a little, yeah. do a Please do. <laughs> well, you know, I, I was going to introduce Dalton saying he's a junior, but we just don't know nowadays. I mean, school's been canceled, so he's either a junior or a senior. We're not sure which uh, where he falls right now. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, and, and, and we're the same way. We converted all of our classes to online classes uh, using Zoom, which was part of our Canvas um, uh, software for students, you know, the online learning software. And after spring break, we came back from spring break and moved, moved almost 800 classes online. So it's, it's been a real challenge. Wow. Incredible. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's, uh, we only got a couple minutes left here. So why don't we give those website addresses where folks can reach out to you guys and uh, pick your brains or get your designs or order some product or whatever they want. Or make a donation. Yes, please. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. yeah. So. so a couple different ways, www.derbosity, D-E-R-B-O-C-I-T-Y.com. 
Um, or you can go to Facebook and do the at symbol Durbosity and that should find us. Um, and through the Dur one of those, you should be able to drill down into the donation page. And I don't have that address memorized. I'm not that good. So <laughs> unfortunately, um, but we look well, forward to talking points. It says here in the talking points, it's corporate at derbosity.com. Yes. Thank you for the email corporate at derbosity.com. Thank you very much. Uh, right. But yeah, reach out to us and we're looking for anybody that wants to help assist donate or otherwise. And most importantly, if you need something from us that we can send out to you, please get a hold of us. All right. Well, that's a, a very nice gesture on your part. Yeah, absolutely. Thank okay. you for having us on here. Well, Thanks. you're welcome. We'll get you that. Uh, we're live now, but we'll get you that on demand video here that you can use on your website once we're done. So thank you so very much. All right. Thanks, guys. Uh, we'll be right back with another segment of our virtual MI Tech TV show. This is Mike Brennan. And it's Matt Roush. And uh, you're watching MI Tech TV. Lawrence Technological University. Okay, All right. Thanks, fellas. Thanks, guys. Hey, thank you guys very much. Take yeah, care. Thank you. Right, you too. Okay, I'll, I'll send you some links about Lawrence Tech just in case you might be interested. Please, please do. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate okay. it. All right. Take, take care. care. Everything. Bye. Salaries yeah. of Lawrence Tech grads are among the highest of any university in America. Plan a campus visit to meet with counselors. Okay, so we have Into Being next. Yep. Find out more. Yeah, I haven't seen them hook in yet. Oh, here they are. Lawrence Technological University is all I told everybody to call and write it there. On the campus, new oh, time research for top companies. Looks like he's literally. Oh, there he is. Okay. Apply what you learn. Be challenged. Be more. You got one coming in via phone only, so I got to unhide video participants. So you're going to see my lo my uh, logo too. Okay. I'm on uh, video and phone. My video is one device. My phone is another. Okay. What do you get at Lawrence Technological University? As a Lawrence Tech. Oh, are we live? <laughs> there we go. Hey, you know, live TV on the, the fun of live TV wow, and yeah. radio and podcasting. Yes, indeed. You never know. So we have. How do you pronounce your last name, Gene? Paranak. Paranak. Okay. And I just uh, met him last week, although we had met previously at one of these Mish Bio functions. Uh, but uh, he has. Uh, Every Friday, you have this impromptu Zoom meeting with all these various PPE, medical supply folks. And I listened in for, well, it was a little, about 90 minutes, I guess. And everybody talks about what their needs are, and they talk about uh, what they can provide. And when did this all start? When did you start doing this? Yeah, Mike. Well, um, when, like so many companies, uh, at Into Being, we thought, well, you know, we work in products and we work in medical devices, we should be able to help somehow. And so we really made an effort to try to, first of all, we were going to work on, on masks. And we, some of our team did a phenomenal job and we delivered a few hundred masks within um, a very short amount of time to a local hospital. And that was great. But we started to realize that we were running into material supply issues. And we started to hear anecdotes from other people saying, well, I could do this, but either I don't understand what FDA is actually saying, or I don't understand what, uh, where to get the materials I need or the testing that I need. And we thought to ourselves, well, this is what we do on a daily basis anyways, is direct traffic for a medical device development, which is the same thing, but at, a, at maybe a larger scale. And we thought, well, we could, we could serve as, as an aggregator. And that's kind of where the, where the, brainchild came for that all right and so uh you've been doing it for how many weeks now it's been about three weeks we've had four shows uh the fifth show will be this friday at uh, 2 p.m now is this something that uh, anybody can sort of uh, come into on or by invite only or how do you run it anybody can anybody can come in um we are so thankful to um the many groups who came together to make it happen the first time. We had uh, folks from Mishbio and the University of Michigan, uh, MEDC, uh, Keystone Product Development on the west side of the state. We had folks from Spectrum Health, um, uh, independent docs over here on the east. So we just had everybody coming together to get the message out to convene the community. And so it's open to anybody. We give an open forum during the meeting 
uh, for folks to make themselves known. So if they're part of a manufacturer or a material supplier or a test house, or there are docs that want to report in on what's happening, health systems that have needs, um, as well as conveners, folks that are, that are making lists and, and getting people put together. Um, and we give them all time to, to talk about those, about those things. In addition to talking about the latest news on the response front, as well as really the core of it is unpacking the FDA's emergency use authorizations so that teams have an understanding of how they can really take practical steps to deliver something. Because some of the most frequent questions are, we're working on masks or we're working on ventilators or something, and we don't really understand what we're being told that we can and can't do. So we like to get hands on with that with folks. Yeah, those emergency regs are letting people get away with a lot of stuff that in, in normal times they would not be able to do, right? It's true, although I think the most common misperception is that somehow the FDA has just taken the reins off, when in reality what they've done is they've let go of some very specific things, but they've retained in place a lot of other very specific things. As always, FDA is concerned with what you say your product is or what it does. None of that has changed, and in fact, many of the labeling regulations are still very much in place and they've gotten a little bit more specific about them. So while there are certain design control activities and other uh, good manufacturing practices that they, in many cases, are waiving, it really starts with the labeling requirements. What are you saying this is good for? So we've had a lot of teams that say, oh, I've got the greatest thing, and it's this antibacterial thing that's going to help with COVID. But in fact, FDA is saying, let's not make claims about that. Let's just be very, very basic and say, this is what we're giving. This is what it does. This is what we're not claiming that it does. So getting down to brass tacks on that can be really helpful for teams. So is the essence of your effort more, it's, it's more medical device related, right, than pharma related? Or is it both? It's definitely, yeah, it's a great question. It's definitely medical device related, although we're, we're trying to touch on the diagnostic uh, EUAs that are coming out there. There's at last count, I think about 40 diagnostic emergency use authorizations. Uh, a couple of us from our team really have a background in uh, automated molecular diagnostics. And so it's natural for us to, to go into that, but that's a big area that's happening really fast. So diagnostic folks are definitely welcome to uh, engage and contribute, and we'll try to make those connections. One of the connections that the diagnostic folks uh, often need and want is to be connected to folks who either have the bug that they can do testing on or to other test houses uh, that they can work with. So we've seen a lot of testing asks that are really critical to the effort. Yeah, right now it seems like what everyone's looking for are the testing kits and the, what's the antibody kits. Uh, and I was reading just today that there's 70 different companies or people or whatever organizations saying that they have these antibody kits that people can use to find out whether or not they've already had COVID and if it turns out that they have, then in theory, I don't know whether it's going to actually happen, but in theory, they could go back out and go back to work and participate because they would essentially be immune. But I didn't hear a lot of that in the meeting on Monday. It was more the more fundamental stuff like masks. And there was a, the woman that called him from the Carolinas had the, the tube that could connect to a, a ventilator and, and, and would be used on two patients. But that was just only for the emergency. And then she had to reclaim all of those and destroy them after whenever the pandemic lets up, right? So it was a really yeah, that's thing, a, so. Yeah, that's exactly right, Mike. I mean, a lot of this stuff is very much, uh, the EUAs generally say that they are for the duration of the public health emergency. So for folks who really want to help, this is a great opportunity for uh, looking at it as, oh, we're going to put product out there. Um, some of the EUAs are saying you're going to have to pull that product back uh, at the end of the public health emergency, whenever that comes. And on the diagnostic side, one of the things that we've seen, and this, this keeps coming up now in the news this week, and we'll talk about that this Friday, is a lot of these diagnostics have, we will see what the validation status of them is. How many false positives, how many false negatives, that's something that's not always clear on the surface. Uh, so I think that's gonna be one of the next things you're gonna be hearing about, and I'm sure we'll be talking about that Friday. 
is what is the validation status because every diagnostic has a false positive and false negative rate associated with it and you hope that those are low but in this case while everything happening it may not be clear yet so what was the genesis of this friday group how did you get this community together well that was not something that we did that was really something that the community did and we were so thankful to all our uh, friends uh, around the state for doing that. Um, uh, some of the early folks who really uh, sent the message out, and I hope I don't forget anybody in saying this, but it was late on a Thursday night, I think, that we were getting the first one together. Uh, and then we had like 230 people show up uh, mm -hmm. it was the next day or the day after. It was just incredible. Um, but uh, I know that uh, Stephen Rapundolo and Alicia from Mishbio um, sent out a big email blast uh, that made a big dent. I know that um, the folks over at U of M, uh, especially Tech Transfer, Kelly Sexton was instrumental. She was the first open forum participant uh, telling us about some of their efforts um, in aggregating people together. I know the folks over at FFMI sent stuff out. Uh, people over at Spectrum Health um, really got in on that first, uh, that first blast. Um, the folks at Ann Arbor Spark and uh, at the Med Health Cluster coming out of Tech Town were instrumental in getting some of that uh, initial word out. Jim Medsker over at Keystone Product Development uh, went out to his list. Um, our friends over at Public Sector Consultants sent it around um, to others. Um, I hope doing that from memory, uh, it's probably somebody I missed there. And, and uh, but um, we had been talking a lot with uh, Kalyan Handik and Priyadarshini Gogoi. Um, who um, are with uh, with Celsi, although we just heard this week all in the news that Celsi just got bought by uh, BioRed, so congratulations. They were instrumental in, in bringing some of the first awareness that there were gonna be some of these shortages to us. And so we had been talking with them a lot early and so they were instrumental uh, in getting that out. But just so many people responded. So Into Being doesn't, uh, doesn't have that kind of convening ability, um, but the community just came together and said, yep, we need to have this discussion and um, we're just privileged to be in a position to facilitate it. Why don't you talk a little bit about Into Being, I'll give you that chance to uh, plug your own company here as well. Uh, how'd you guys start? What specifically, I know it's a medical device area, but I'm not totally clear on what it is. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Well, so Into Being um, is now just a little bit over 10 years old. Um, myself and my colleague, Aaron Kerr, with a bunch of uh, local startups. Um, most notably, uh, we were both with Handy Lab and then he was with uh, Accurate Cytometers. Um, and we've got a team that consists of uh, product development uh, experts. Um, and what we do is we work with new product development efforts on the actual design controls, the hands-on design readiness for design for manufacturability, as well as on the regulatory submissions, including pre-submissions and 510K submissions. So our bread and butter is doing medical device development for new product development efforts with everything from startups, independent mm -hmm. vendors, to now mid to large sized uh, companies that are working on their new product lines. And so it put us in a great position to say, you know what we do every day is we work with regulations and actually implementing them down at the level of hands-on stuff. Why don't we start talking about emergency use authorizations? So I think that was a nice, that was a nice link between what we do on a daily basis and, and the current need. Okay. All right. So what do you think are the highlights so far of this effort? Well, I think the biggest highlight is just to see the whole, the whole community uh, coming together. Um, it's been really neat to see how MEDC has been bringing, um, bringing everyone together and, and maintaining a master database and so many little efforts have been feeding into that. So give them a lot of credit for, um, for doing that. And that's been really cool to see people have been coming together and, largely, uh, I would say 95%, there's no self-interest. A hmm. lot of times it's just, I'm gonna spend the time on the phone and I'm just gonna do it. And that I think has been overwhelming to see so many people just coming out of the woodwork. There always be one or two who are like, they, they wanna make a buck off of it, but that is just by and large, not what I'm seeing on a daily basis on the phone late at night with folks. It's just not what I'm seeing. So that's been exciting. And um, I think, you know, in terms of the show on Fridays, it's been it's been fun. We had uh, Sundaresh Gramasandra, uh, old friend of mine, um, with pneumotics, um, with their uh, emergency use authorization. He came on and told us about that. We had a rep 
rep from Cellex uh, with their diagnostic, like you mentioned, uh, Mike, uh, Marjorie um, was on from uh, the group in South Carolina that did the Vesper connector. Um, and so we've just had a lot of cool things, a lot of big companies that if I put the names out there um, that are trying to help with the effort um, have been on the call. Uh, some have made themselves known, some haven't, but some incredibly large companies that are looking to contribute resources, help with manufacturing uh, have been a part of that. And so um, there's really just been a lot of interest and a lot of connection happening. We've had material suppliers connecting with folks who can build stuff. Um, just got an email. Uh, we got a local hospital system in touch with somebody who can make gowns for them. They had no way of getting in touch with, and that connection got me. And so I think we're just really excited about those connections that are happening and the level of disinterested public service that people are investing into this. Unfortunately, we're out of time in this segment. Why don't you give that, that address where folks can find out more if they want to participate in the Friday calls? Thanks, Mike. Yeah, it's intobeing.com slash COVID connect, I-N-2-B-E-I-N-G dot com slash COVID connect. And that's every uh, Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern time, right? Every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern time, and we usually run for about an hour and a half. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Gene Peranek from Into Being. Uh, this is a worthy effort uh, these days. Uh, best of luck to you, and congratulations. Matt and Mike, thank you both so much. Really appreciate having me on. All, All right. right. Thanks very much. We'll be right back with the, the prophet of doom, Fred Brown, who will talk about uh, <laughs> what the latest is on the COVID. Uh, okay. For right now, it's Matt Roush. And Mike Brennan. And you're watching at MITechnews.tv. As a Lawrence Technological University. Gene, you're welcome to stick around if you'd like and listen to Fred. Yes, more. Here's the beginning oh, sure. of us once a week. When it comes to graduate salaries. I'll, I'll hang have, around for a minute. Top we don't have talking I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm uh, oh, there my, there is the profit like of you. Yeah, sure. I've got hay fever. <laughs> it's just plain old hay fever. <laughs> now, we don't have talking points on Fred, but what he's going to be talking about is the antibody test and the general testing out there, what's going on with that. So, sure. Absolutely. We'll run with that. So, no no mask and no gloves. He graduates, earn a degree. Next time I'll wear a face shield. Oh, uh, okay. Some of my friends are producing face shields, so uh, why not? We'll, we'll, we'll show them how the face shield works. Right, I'm going to turn my video off and go on mute, and then I'll drop off after uh, this gentleman. Okay, okay. Yes. Lawrence Tech grads are among the highest of any university in America. If you want me to help you with your LinkedIn, just make me an admin. Oh, I, I need that desperately. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'll talk to you after the show about how to do that. So. Perfect. Hey, it's Matt Roush. And Mike Brennan. And we're back with another segment of the M Squared TechCast at MITechnews.tv. And we have returning, dun, 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 Fred Brown. <laughs> <laughs> we used to say that about our cybersecurity guys that would come on and scare everybody, but Fred, I think, has trumped them, you know? So, yeah, this uh, is just a, this is a, yeah, physical threat is worse than cyber threat, definitely. Yes, yes. So one of the things that, that Fred wants to talk about is, and I've been hearing a lot, just, I think it was yesterday I was reading, there are 70 companies that claim they have some sort of antibody test that is really important right now because it'll determine if you have had COVID and you're over COVID, meaning in theory, you can go about back onto your, you know, your job or mingle or the, what do they call it? The herd immunity or whatever it's right. called. Yes. Yes. So uh, that, that's, that's right. That's one of my areas. Uh, actually, I know quite a bit about because I was, um, I, I, at one point was an executive at the world's leading manufacturer of monoclonal antibodies. So uh, oh. the idea is that uh, when your body gets attacked, it produces antibodies. And these antibodies are actually permanent records of the fact you've been attacked. And they're specific just for that disease you've got. So what's nice about that is if you can detect the antibody, then you can know whether you've ever been exposed and had a reaction to the disease. And chances are, if you've been <clears throat> exposed and have, a, have had a reaction to the disease, you'll be able to fend it off much better. And so that's what they call herd immunity. If, if you've got enough of the herd uh, safe and filled with antibodies, then even if a sick person comes in or a sick part of the herd comes in, uh, they will. Uh, they'll. They, they can't spread it anywhere because everyone else around them is 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 immune. Yeah, that would really be nice. I think the biggest issue right now is it's, <coughs> you can't get your arms around with the situation until you test people to know whether they have it or whether they have had it 
And we don't know any of those answers. I mean, what, 5% of the people might have been tested at this point? Oh, less, less well, like than like 1%, that. isn't it? Yeah. It's even, sadly, it's even less than that. <laughs> <We've> <laughs> had, actually, it's been about 2.2, I believe, million people so far have been tested. It, it's, luckily, it's growing fast, which is great. Uh, and and not all, that, that's not only the antibody test. That, all, that mixes in with it something called the polymerase chain reaction test, or the PCR test. And that actually determines just whether, you've had, ha, whether you have the, the disease that's actively shedding a, uh, the viral pieces. So you've got two different tests. One is to say, I've got the virus. And the other one is to say, I've had the virus and survived. And then that monoclonal antibody says, I've had the virus and I've survived. And the PCR test says, I've got the virus active in me. Sometimes you know it because you have symptoms, but about half the time or so, we think people don't even know it. Now, I know the vaccine is still a long ways off, but what I don't understand is, and maybe it's just because the scale of the problem is so large, is why we don't have these tests. I mean, it seems like there's a lot of very large companies out there that could really be focused on this. And, you know, obviously they're not going to give them away. I mean, I don't think they're not stop war profiteering or anything, but essentially, I mean, they would be compensated for their costs, but is it just take a long time to spool this up or what? Yeah. So the PCR test doesn't take so long. What happened was on January 10th, uh, China released the genetic code for the virus. So they knew they had the virus, they isolated it, and then they, uh, did all sorts of work with it, and they realized these are the gen this is the genome of the, of the virus, and they released that to everybody. And they said, "Here's the here's the here's the genetic code." At that point, we could actually start to work on tests. Until January, so until January 10th, because it's a brand new disease, we couldn't do anything. After January 10th, that's when the clock started, and we've done pretty well. Uh, the PCR tests uh, came out relatively quickly. Unfortunately, we had a hiccup with them. Uh, in February, and so they, they got stopped, and that prevented us from understanding who actually had the disease. The monoclonal antibody test, the first one came out about a week ago, was approved, I think on March, uh, I think on April 1st it was approved. It's an Abbott test, it's called a rapid test, and, uh, uh, and there the issue is you actually, so the, you actually have to produce the antigen so that you can uh, detect the antibody. The antibody has to go in, into the test and it has to actually attach itself and then a signal is released and you say, aha, the antibody's there. So you've got to actually create this, this antigen and then, the, and then put the blood in it and it reacts. Well, creating the antigen at high scale is actually is, is, is challenging. So Abbott right now has the ability to produce about 100,000 of these machines every day. And these machines can test, each, each machine can test about 475 samples in a day. Hmm. So that's pretty quick. And we should be getting a lot more results now that they're, they're coming out. But it's not, unfortunately, it's not nearly enough. We are under capacity by a lot because it's a brand new, it's a brand new, <laughs> brand new disease. The PCR test, uh, we had something much more early, but it's, it's slow. It, uh, the Abbott test takes between five minutes if you are, if, if you're, if you're positive and 15 minutes if you're negative for the, for the antibodies. The PCR test, um, when it's unautomated like we had, it was brand new, uh, it can take uh, a good lab technician can take about six, seven hours just to get to understand whether you've got it. So you can imagine the backup when you got hundreds of tests coming in at you with brand new disease and you're trying to, you know, pipette and <laughs> mix, remix reagents that you're not familiar with and all that, that, that takes a long time. And we only have about 168 of those machines in the whole United States. Wow. So that's what, what that's what caught us. Now, uh, they just announced late last week and starting this week that in Michigan here, we're going to have 13 drive through testing facilities. Um, so uh, if I uh, get them listed, I, I, it was in my newsletter uh, this morning and it's on my website for people wanting locations, but it's most of the major big cities. We don't have one here in Ann Arbor, but there's one in Jackson and one in Detroit uh, and then scattered around the rest of the state. So that will be somewhat helpful, right? Oh, absolutely. The, the drive-through test is just what you want to do. You want to call your doctor uh, so that you're on the list, you get on a, you, you know, and, and then, you're, you, then, then the doctor can get your results, explain them to you, and talk to you about various, you know, interventions and treatments uh, and, uh, and what you should do next. And so that's, it's, it's important to kind of call your doctor first, get the okay, move through the, go into the line, get your test done. If you can, I would avoid sitting there if you think you're sick and you don't think the rest of your family is sick don't bring the rest of your family with you to get sick in the car if there's a long wait 
they'll all get sick with you and catch the disease. So, you know, stay by yourself uh, and make sure um, that the test is done, that the swab really goes into your nose. I know it's uncomfortable, but, and the swab really goes down your throat. Because that, mm -hmm. the biggest problem with the PCR test, it's very, very precise, but if, you, if the swab misses uh, your, the, 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 the disease, it can come up negative and you'll be positive and, uh, and you'll actually be positive, which means you'll go out there thinking you're all fine and you'll get infect everybody. So make sure they give them a chance to really get in there uh, because it turns out that our leading swab manufacturer in the world, the gold standard for swab manufacturing for this particular test is located in Lombardy, Italy, which had a death rate that was 10% of the people there died. Of this mm. 10% uh, of the people who were infected died uh, of it. It was a, just a terrible situation. And unfortunately, that, that, that whole manufacturing facility has been shut down. So we now are using not quite as good swabs to do these tests. If you're doing a monoclonal antibody test, you just have to give a, a finger prick and move on. I'm not sure which tests are, are available at the te testing centers. All right. So, so do we know whether once you've had it, you are immune? Um, I mean, I know there, there have been some reports coming out of China of people testing positive for the active disease again yes. after they've recovered from it. Yes. So there, that's a great point. And it's a really important question to have, get answered. Uh, and we're trying to work on that. Uh, so there are different kinds of antibodies that are responding. There's a special kind of antibody called a neutralizing antibody. And that's the ones that you really want to focus on. Uh, because the neutralized antibodies actually do kill the, the virus. The other antibodies are there to signal and to bring other uh, killer antibodies in, uh, but they're, they don't actually do anything except signal your own body. So um, if, if you are positive, then the nice thing about that is if you give blood and you have the right titers, you can save other people's lives. So uh, go to your blood bank, donate your blood to the extent you can, and they can use that then to protect people who are fighting the fight. Uh, the nurses, and they can also uh, improve the opportunity for some people who are dying to perhaps uh, live. So mm -hmm. I didn't answer your question, though. Uh, what was your uh, repeat for me? I I, I only answered. Oh, it's it's. it's are, are we sure that having had this oh. and having those antibodies does Perfect. confer uh, immunity? Yes. Yeah, so there there. So this is a coronavirus. This is first of all, it's a brand new virus. So we're, the answer is we don't know yet. We think so because it's in a family of viruses called the called coronaviruses. Uh, most so there's seven different kinds, and you know there's the sniffles. There's four of those are cold types of, of, of coronaviruses. Then you've got SARS, which killed a lot of people, sadly, um, and MERS and a few others. So those are the coronaviruses, and we know uh, from our experience that coronaviruses, once you get them once, you do have a slight immunity, and those that immunity tends to last between eight and eighteen months, depending on. And we, but we're still trying to, but we can, it's only been four months we have it, so we don't really know the answer to the question yet, how long it'll last, how effective it's going to be, that, those questions we don't know. One thing, um, so, that, uh, so that, that's, that's uh, uh, I, I, I got lost, but I, I was going to say one more thing, but I can't, I can't remember, I'm sorry, Matt, go ahead, one more well, time. Because I, I know that there are some viruses that, you know, you have them once and then that's it. There are some viruses that can come back in a slightly different oh, form, like chickenpox comes back as shingles, right? Yes, so. you ask you ask about you ask about the Chinese results. That's yes. true. They got it once, and they came back and got it again. And there are two uh, theories to that. First, you didn't have immunity, so in other words, you had a little bit of a response, but it wasn't enough to get the neutral enough neutralizing antibodies going. So that wasn't okay. quite enough. You have to get infected again, sadly. The other and more probable cause is that what happens to the coronavirus is that it, it, it runs away. You know, it realizes, oh my God, I'm getting attacked by the immune system. And then it runs into different parts of your body. So it might, they call it sequestering. So it might sequester itself in the lymph system or some other area. And then when you're sort of tired out, not physically fit, haven't, haven't had your vegetables, uh, it comes <laughs> back, you know, with a roar. And so that's, that's, uh, that's what we think happened in those cases in China. Okay. All right, so we got about two minutes left, and I just got a, a text from Dave saying he definitely has to wrap at three. So let's just address this last issue. Everybody's thinking that we're going to have summer and fall sports where we get hundreds of people or thousands of people together or tens of thousands. And I know we've talked about this before, but we need to let people know that this is probably not going to be when it's going to happen, right? 
No, in fact, uh, uh, pro I don't think we can control it well enough. Uh, we went through the example of, you know, what happens if you could test everybody going into the stadium with a thermal thermal scan? That's another kind of test that can uh, tells you whether you've got a temperature right. or not. And we, you know, we did the math, and it would take us, you know, five days to load the stadium up. <laughs> <laughs> so it's good. and we open up all the gates. Food vendors would go. Well, there, I was going to say there are some people who enjoy a good tailgate, but five <laughs> days is a pretty long tailgate. It's a long tailgate. <laughs> so, so that that's going to be a challenge. My so what Major League Baseball is talking about is sort of interesting. They're saying, look, we can protect our players, get them all figured out and whether they have the disease or not. And they can play all down in Arizona. So they'll be down in Arizona. You can watch them on TV. You know, they'll all be there together playing and practicing, which is great. And then you'll be able to watch them on TV. You won't be able to come into the stadium. Um, you know, very, you know, you just still have to have huge separate. Well, that would, I was going to say, that would be more fun to watch than the 30-year-old NASCAR races that Fox is putting on TV right now. And <laughs> That's right. Them. At least it's something new. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and who knows it might even improve the well i shouldn't say it, but yeah so I, I think so that that i know major league baseball is thinking about that i'm going to be talking with someone who can tell me more uh, about that tonight actually he's uh, he runs the san francisco giants so unfortunately uh, we're going to have to leave it at that fred we're fast approaching three o'clock if folks want to reach out to you give them uh, your email address again so I have, I have an email address just for COVID now because uh, people are starting to ask me a lot of questions, and that's just, which is absolutely fine. It's fred.brown.covid at gmail.com. All right. Okay. I want to thank Fred Brown. Thank all of our guests today, the financier, Bob Moore, the father and son team uh, working on 3D printing, uh, Darren and Dalton Luke, uh, working on 3D printing protective gear for our first responders and frontline health care workers, and Gene Peranak from Into Being, uh, convening a weekly session on how Michigan medical device companies can help. Uh, be back here at 2 o'clock Eastern time next Monday. For right now, it's Matt Rausch. And Mike Brennan. And you've been watching the M Squared TechCast at mitechnews.tv. Okay, thanks, Fred. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I, 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 I There were so many parts of the question to answer that... <laughs> I got lost here and there. Was that all right? No, I'm oh, yeah, fine.